Welcome to The Gray Report. A new print of CPI from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics show that inflation has come down to only 3.2%. What does that mean for the economy and specifically for multifamily real estate as so many owners and operators um, are looking to either kind of refinance or figure out all these loans that are maturing? assets that you know might be good pieces of real estate but are just troubled financially so is this kind of that positive news that those owners need to see is it giving enough confidence in the market that rates will be lower sometime next year so that kicking that can down the road may work out or is it too little too late we're going to dig into it. Also, a report from the Urban Land Institute talking again about the emerging trends in real estate. A really great report that they put out recently from CBRE looking at, you know, what is uh, the stress on the road to distress? Because, you know, you've heard us talk about it almost on a weekly basis. There's a lot of potential for distress on the market. There are already some distress deals, but not that many. Everyone is, seems to be certain that there's going to be more distress. But what does it look like and what does it take to get there and also just looking back at some of their previous predictions from CBRE in terms of kind of timing the bottom of the market or the top of cap rates. And then from Yardi Matrix, looking at a really incredibly important fundamental factor in any time you're investing. It's critical right now. It's driving operations and fundamentals. And that is supply. So a supply forecast from Yardi Matrix again. The performance of assets right now, you know, take the interest rate, take financing out. The supply is putting pressure on rents, occupancy, not just in A class units, but also B and C class properties, which is fascinating. We're going to talk about it all and more. So if you're a multifamily investor, active, passive, somewhere in there in the middle, you're in the industry. We appreciate you taking the time joining us today. This is the show that we put together especially for you to bring you up to date with all the new research and data, and what's going on in the industry. This is going to keep you up to speed, help you make some really good decisions. Or, you know, at least you're going to go to this, these uh, holiday parties pretty soon. You're going to know what's going on. You're in the know. So we feel like we're typically, um, you know, two, three weeks ahead, Matt, you know, oh, before yeah. you start hearing about it on the mainstream media. Not always the case, um, but we do try to stay on the bleeding edge. Stick around for the whole episode. Make sure you subscribe to the Great Capital YouTube channel. You give this video a like, a comment. You know, we're also on every podcast network. We're on YouTube. We're doing, we're trying to do as many deals as we can here at Great Capital for accredited investors. So from the Indianapolis studios, let's get into it, Matt. Welcome back to the report. Hello. Joined again, Dr. Matt Bosnoggle. How the heck are you, Matt? So good to be here. <laughs> I'm pretty good. I'm yeah. glad you're here. Um, really interesting. We had a print CPI yesterday morning mm-hmm. on Tuesday. Much lower inflation. Not incredibly su- surprising. I found that the um, coverage on the lead up to this CPI print was not nearly um, to the level of where it has been in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been talking, Matt, you know, just looking at where rents had starting to decline a little over a year ago. Now, we said it wouldn't be surprising to see rent showing up in C- CPI starting to decline around mm-hmm. this time. We thought it might start even last month. Yeah. We're starting to see it come down. It really hasn't come. It really hasn't caught up fully, yeah. but a big decrease in you know, overall inflation rate, you know, clicking at, you know, 3.2%. It's above the Fed's target of 2%. Yep. We're getting closer. They say that last mile may be the hardest to get, That's but man, the stock market, true. investors, you know, every sort of market commentator, they, they are you know, screaming on the rooftops of, you know, no more recession, soft landing. Yeah. You know, it seems like we have this immaculate disinflation, which sounds great. Although what it's setting up and the, the concern is we're just going to be entering this slow, sloggy growth of maybe we don't have a crash. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but without that recession, you know, are we just in a period of, okay, things are okay, but it's just very slow growth. Yeah. But the question I have, Matt, for you, maybe right before we get into kind of some of the details in the CPI report, okay, inflation's down a little bit. Mm-hmm. The Fed hasn't said they're going to lower rates. Mm-hmm. For a multifamily borrower who you know has a loan right now, what does this mean to them? Does it mean anything at all? Um, I don't think it should mean anything at all. Um, I think that what you've got to look for is a pattern. And 
uh, just kind of what you said, there's so much reactivity. Um, you know, stock markets are, are famously volatile, and they've been waiting for this, for the slightest sign uh, that the interest rates were going to be lower. So looking at this reaction, this rally, um, is uh, is a little bit misplaced. And I think that if I was a multifamily borrower, yeah, I would look for a, a pattern, but also be ready to be ready to acknowledge that like any decrease is going to happen over a long term. So if I was a multifamily borrower, I'd start setting up a long term plan yeah. because it's not going to be instant relief. As happy as a lot of people yeah. were yesterday, it's not going to happen all. So yeah, certainly not by the end of the year. I think most optimistic maybe halfway through next year, but I, I think a lot of people you know are in the camp of it could be you know well beyond a year before things start yeah. uh, really moving in, in a material way. But Okay, so we're not going. The rates are going to come down overnight by any means. Um, there's not even really discussion of that. Just you know, yep. potential the way things could go. What about the confidence, though? You know, because in a lot of the situations, mm -hmm. there's conversations with borrowers and with their lenders and trying to see if we can modify these loans. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of conversation. Really, two things. You know, one, there's a ton of modifications that are going on. The can is being kicked down the road. Mm -hmm. Is this new data point? going to give enough confidence to maybe some of these banks, some of these lenders to say, all right, you're a decent sponsor. We'll work with you because we do really believe now, even though we've said this multiple times, that rates are going to be lower in a year and we want to give you that extra year. I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's the signal that I've been getting. Now, this is outside of the CPI, but some of the other reports in here is talking about how banks are starting to feel pressure from regulators and they, they don't want, they don't want all these assets on their, on their books. Um, for capital requirements, mm -hmm. as well as just a kind of maybe like a de-risking thing when it comes particularly to, to office, but but to a some certain extent, uh, non-zero extent multifamily. Yeah, so they're looking at it just as their CRE yeah. uh, b bucket on their balance sheet. Not, yeah. not always. I'm sure maybe there is some context given to office versus multifamily and, you know, what's a, you know, asset with potential performance versus an asset that, you know, there's really kind of no... Um, you know, path or, or or direction for. So, so you're saying, Matt, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is even though that there may be an intent in the bank or lender may say, you know, we would like to modify this loan for you, we would like to work for you. Yeah, the regulators in in many cases are coming in, or maybe the banks themselves mm -hmm. um, so are looking at their balance sheet. Yeah. They need some bigger problems rather than just modifying a few loans. They have to get some of these assets just off their balance sheet you know, entirely. Won't be able to modify. Yeah. Is that is that more that or less seems what's... like it? And it's not like it's a crisis yeah. because in a crisis, then you may th you may start thinking about well, do they, are they really you know are they going to try and squeeze every last drop out of this? They're making Probably, some yeah. some like logical decisions that they just have to like reorient themselves, and um, and it's not even preparing for a catastrophe. It's just uh, y you know, the, it's like a regulation issue, yeah. and I think that uh, I think that trying to hope that they will work things out may not be great for banks, but for private investors, mm. that may be another thing. Um, yeah. and that's all you know. This this is all covered in this in the CBR video. That uh, okay. Well, I'm I'm excited to get to that in the yeah. CPI. But so just last question, you know, on this, and, and again, so just hearing what you're saying, reading, reading the analysis, I'm sure that there will be some cases where the bank can still work with lenders and, and modify the loans. Yeah. But there's not going to be so – tell, tell me if this analogy is uh, <laughs> correct or not. There's not going to be enough lifeboats on, on the on the ship. Like there, there are some yeah. – like there are some lifeboats – you know, women and children first, mm -hmm. what they say, but it's really, you know, whoever's in the tuxedos, yeah, know, their I, best it, clients, and then everyone yeah. else can listen to the band as it goes, goes down. Yeah, I, I, no, I kind of agree. I think that that's a pretty good analogy. And it's and it's almost like what we're seeing is the is a little bit of like the cost of these extensions for the banks. You know, if everything worked out, maybe all these, all, all these, uh, mm -hmm. all these loans Yeah, but it's not out. free, right? Yeah, they're gonna, yeah. They're, you're going to have to bring some money to the table. You're going to put some collateral up. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to probably, you know, fund a reserve account. The bank is is making a little bit less money than they than they thought they would make if they have to do you know yeah. an extension at, un, at terms that are less favorable for them. Um, yeah, so they're not going to want to do that unless they have to. Yeah, They'd rather put yeah. it on a sponsor to 
Yeah. So and that. and that's and that's what we're seeing. That's what we talked about for the past couple of weeks is really how these private investors are are stepping up. And um, it, and it's I think it's going to be really interesting to see how how things shake out. Um, I know that there is another um, and I didn't cover this because I didn't understand it. But there is another wave of bank regulations that uh, that's like working its way through Congress or mm. something or, yeah. or the Fed. Um, and I, gosh, it was like. End time. Oh man, I have to end times. It. I think it had the That's word they like it. <laughs> they had. They, it had end time in its name or something like that. It had some dramatic name, uh, and and I might have to cut this, but uh, but <laughs> no, it's good. but there is you know there there's also additional re- there's regulations that are kind of uh, that are o- overhanging this whole environment, and uh, but I don't think it's it's necessarily all driven by regulations. It could also be driven by the you know the performance of the assets themselves and um and the fact that these are. The they're having to deal with sometimes troubled borrowers, yeah. and um, and fixing those troubles comes at a cost to someone. Um, and yeah, it, and, yeah, the no free yeah, lunch, right? Yeah. And so, it, yes. so Matt, again, transitioning to the CPI report, but I'm really just using it as like a talking point to ask you some other yeah. more questions uh, about the market. Again, mm-hmm. you know, three point two percent before you know seasonal adjustments. So from a buyer's perspective, though, again, so the 10 year Treasury, you know, went from, you know, we, we almost basically we brushed 5 percent. Now mm-hmm. we're under four and a half percent. I think the consensus talking to most other people in the market that the 10 year Treasury, uh, t- sorry, the 10 year at 5 percent really sunk a lot of deals. There weren't a whole lot of deals that were making sense at that level. Mm-hmm. This cap rates just again, they're not people are just necessarily changing the price because interest rates move up in one day although you know it it certainly affects things yeah and also for the not to lose um track but for everyone that says that interest rates and cap rates aren't correlated watch what happens in a negotiation when interest rates move and the price changes yeah yeah so i don't know you know um Mm -hmm. no again is there a long-term correlation is it perfect no but i I see more deals move because interest rates move more than anything totally um so but matt are people now in an is it an environment now with the ten year coming down below four and a half percent? Are deals starting to make sense because it seems like cap rates have been rising? You mm-hmm. know, are we getting closer to an environment where we can make sense on the buy side? I think we're getting closer. Um, you know, talking to to Addison on you know who's part of like the acquisitions team, he, he's seen he's he's noticed you know a lot more deals coming to the market. Um, but I don't. I have heard him say there's a. He says usually, you know, this time of year, yeah. usually things slow down. So mm-hmm. you're getting, getting ready to go into the holidays. A lot of brokers, you know, will say, hey, let's hold off and bring this deal to the market, but let's wait till end of January. We'll roll it out at, you know, NMHC, yeah. National Family Housing Council, you know, annual meeting. Mm-hmm. But he's saying what we're seeing on the market is just a ton of deals, more than we usually see this time of year. Yeah. And it, it has to be that, you know, People are getting a little bit of desperate and they're floating their deals. There's a maturity that's coming up in the next 12 months mm-hmm. and they don't want to wait. And they're just trying to see if there's any offers. Yeah. But not a lot of offers that are coming in anywhere close. I mean, the last deal that we looked at, I mean, I think we were still, I mean, we were almost $10 million, you know, at our price below what they were asking for. Yeah. You know, I 30% it, below. It is interesting because I was always, you know, I, I was thinking like, what is it going to take and what is it going to look like? for prices to really adjust to the interest rate environment for for the market to adjust to what um the the urban land institute calls the great reset yeah and yeah. um and and it looks like we're in phase one and phase one is the call it extended pretend mm-hmm. call it accommodations uh or, or call it what you will <laughs> but um but the but the the real effect is like this is a lending thing. Now we're dealing with lending or are people trying to solve it in the debt markets? And um and yeah. if if that follows through or once that kind of process is through, yeah. whether they can get help or not, then it's gonna be in the sales market. So it's interesting that we've seen these phases of like, well, now let's try to solve it with debt. And if we can't, we're gonna solve it with a sale. Yeah. Um so maybe the sales might come might pop up, you know, at the end of Q one or something once once people start realizing yeah. what debt problem they have that can't be solved without yeah. getting new lending. Yeah. So I guess any other thoughts on CPI? Yes. I mean, I, I what, do, what, do you, what do you think? I Matt? did want to know wanna, that, like, so so um, one thing to note is, you know, everyone says that, that CPI was driven by shelter, and shelter was a was a big component, and rent hasn't come down 
as much. It's really stayed at uh, 0.5% month over month for the past few months, which equates to like a 6% annual inflation or a little more if you kind of compound that. But but still, um, the it's it's been fairly steady and elevated still. Rent has not had that decline that we predicted, but it should be coming. If if gravity and math and all the, you know, all the fundamental forces of the universe are correct, then it should be it should be coming because we have seen that so much in the in the market. Matt, can you do, you do you know and, and then you can t- you can tell me to edit this out mm-hmm. what the difference between rent of shelter and rent of primary residence rent is? of primary residence is more like apartments and rent of shelter could be like vacation homes or something like that okay because um, that's i know rent of primary residence or it's the the equivalent you yeah, know, rent yeah. is like the metric that we typically lose use as kind of the proxy to kind of you know market rates but yeah i was curious about this rent of shelter because it is down about half uh, from it was you know the previous month yeah and a month over month growth of 0.3 and shelter overall which does make up you see here 34 percent of the enti- you know total cpi yeah. which we've been tracking it and when we have some unique insight into the housing market it is down from last month's you know uh, growth of 0.6 down mm-hmm. to 0.3 um which is kind of tracking it's the prior uh, month's growth rate so it's it, it's you know it's not um it's not getting worse, yeah. I guess, but it's not moving as low as yeah. it could. It's still got room to, to drop. And what's interesting is you, you can see, um, so you were talking about rent of shelter. So, so rent of primary residence is up 0.5 and lodging away from home is a negative 2.5. So all those Airbnbs, maybe they got <laughs> they got canceled or yeah. or, or whatever it is, um, This uh, that equivalent, for that element of rent is not, uh, not doing as well. Yeah, um, including hotels, motels. So that that's good news. Yeah, it's good news. It's a, a little bit cheaper. Um, yeah. And now I'm, you know, this is you know part of the economy, especially in the hospitality that had been growing since the pandemic. You know, mm-hmm. it's obviously a huge hit in the pandemic. I'm curious if this is, um, you know, a sign of you know less consumer spending, consumer yeah. confidence, people you know maybe traveling a little bit less. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. You know, yeah. who, who knows? I maybe mean, that's a typical thing. I'd have to look at, see what the like, September month is. And, and but, yeah, maybe there's a, some seasonal um, yeah. effect a, as well that could be at play here. But I also wanted to kind of put in um, a little bit of a context to the the headline number, which was which was 3.2 percent, um, the year over year inflation number. So 3.2 percent higher than last year. And um, and the last month was so for September, it was 3.7. Um, and so you see 3.2, less than 3.7. That's great. Um, but in June, it was 3.0. So th- yeah. it's been a little bit bumpy. And that's what everyone said. You know, th- there's going to be a little bumps on the road as we go down. But um, so but I th- but still like to kind of return to it, this this stock market rally that we see. And I don't know it may be already correcting as we speak, given how volatile markets are. Um, but it was, you know, it was a, a bacchanalia of a rally, really, on November 14th. And I'm sure there was a good amount of bots and AI trading algorithms involved. But I see a lot of human irrationality in there. And I think that um, and, and and this is in my notes. I'm kind of repeating my argument, but like I'm trying to take this argument mm-hmm. because doesn't lower. So lower inflation that has got to mean lower interest rates. And I think, yeah, sure, it will. But eventually yeah, i was gonna yeah. say uh, eventually and then the last fed meeting jerome and pals didn't did uh did not raise interest rates but he didn't say anything about lowering them and so as much as people scrutinize jay powell's every word and behavior i think one of the goals of their messaging is to stay hawkish too so so you, you they'll always err on the side of hawks but um i think that uh, that it's still 3.2 is still higher than the Fed's inflation target, and um, and you know people might be uh, <laughs> people might be looking for a uh, a 2.5 percent inflation target rather than a two because because the historical average is like is like around three, but uh, I I don't know I don't well, know what what the Fed would well, say. The last that. ten years it was below two, yeah. and they you know the Fed was dreaming of you know this level of inflation like this would have been in their mind like Goldie Goldilocks because yeah. if we were you know sub two percent growth we get some three percent growth. There's there's been talk in the past that maybe the target rate should be closer to three mm-hmm. percent, but in their mind to get to two if we've just had a period of you know six to six to ten 
we need a yeah. little bit of a period, you know, below two. That may okay. That may makes a little more sense to me. But then. but but again, it's like what are your what's the period you're averaging? Because if you go yeah. back the last ten years, well, we've had plenty of you know, sub two percent growth. Mm-hmm. So maybe you don't need too much longer, you know, below two percent. And I was thinking about that too. But like the historical average also includes like all that time and all these the lengthy inflationary periods and like yeah, the seventies, like eighties, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so and so like the true. I don't know. I don't think that the true mean is three. But I don't. Two seems awfully low, and I'd be. I think that everyone would be happy with two and a half. Um, I think, I, but something predictable, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I think. I think so. But I mean, the question, you know. The, and, and actually, yeah. we do have footage of Powell's state of mind here, and I'd love to see what he might have to say. I think that this might be in reference to the two percent inflation target. Um, Just close the fucking door. Close the door. U.S. inflation has come down over the past year, so but remains well above. We're closing the door. Uh, oh no, no, no! I'd like so. Okay, so target. So, my colleagues. He's and talking I are, about of course, his two percent target. by this progress, but we expect that the process of getting inflation sustainably down to two percent has a long way to go. Hmm. The labor market remains tight, although improvements in labor supply and a gradual easing in demand continue to move it into better balance. GDP growth in the third quarter was quite strong, but like most forecasters, we expect growth growth to moderate in coming quarters. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, it's not good. Yeah, here's like sure. a okay. Risk Thank you. you Thank you very much. Before, yes, thank you very much. Before. Thank you. Wait. Just close the fucking door. Close the door. Okay, so wow. I mean, I mean, of a uh, few words, um, of, of great action, you know, Matt. Again, <laughs> yes. you know, trying to look at. <laughs> I spent some time in analyzing this, and yeah, if you will what indulge those, what me, what do those words mean? So, what is it? you can argue <laughs> that Powell's comments were in reference to the interruption of his IMF talk by climate protesters. Sure, you could say that's the yeah, proximate cause. Maybe. But what was he talking about Something right before that interruption? You think they just let those climate protesters on the stage, Matt? To I don't down think the, that rabbit maybe hole? he didn't even notice them. He was talking about his 2% yeah. inflation target. You just got to close the door on it? Yeah, yeah. He said, close the door. Yeah, yeah. You think it, Do you really think said. that we're going we're gonna to lower rates soon? Close the door. Yeah, he wants to be the hawk because you know it's a better. Bird. What if he had like let some other you know Freudian slip? I mean, does that just seems like it's a raw moment of him? Yeah, like, yeah. What, what if he had come out and and give, given some indication? Or are you saying that the, the indication has been given? That's oh yeah. Hey, if people are already analyzing every single drop of sweat, you yeah. know that he gives in, in in his talks and stuff, then I think that it's fair to say that that in in this uh, angry, I don't want to even say outburst, he's just communicating the fa- he's 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 so, filling his role as a communicator in in this moment. So you know, and the other factor here, man, we were talking about this beforehand. Pal has to take the stance. Yeah, a hawkish stance yeah, to convince the sure. market that he's not going to lower rates because otherwise he's going to drive inflation yeah. higher. Mm-hmm. He has to, you know, come off hawkishly. But at the point where he wants to, you know, bring rate rates down, mm-hmm. which we, you know, we've got, we, we talked about this beforehand. He's going to have to balance the pressure, the political pressure, yeah. for avoiding a recession and not having a sluggish economy before the next election, mm-hmm. and just what his mandates. Are and if they the Fed believes that they need to maintain rates at a certain level, if they really need to bring growth down to achieve their object objectives. Mm-hmm. Those two um, those two things can be at odds. Now yeah. he has no you know obligation to you know help you know Joe Biden get you know reelected. I don't think he's really probably interested. But in even that. if he was trying, you know, regardless, there's pressure. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of pressure now. In the threading of the needle, which mm-hmm. again I don't think he's going to want to do this, but to lower, you know, the longer term market driven, you know, longer term maturity treasuries and other bonds, all he has to do is kind of sort of suggest that they are yeah. are thinking about lowering rates, mm-hmm. and then you think that you know the drop from you know basically five percent down to you know four point four percent of the ten year treasury, if that happened quick, yeah, he just you know hints. And they might lower rates. You know, we're going to we could easily be down, you know, below four percent on the 10 year treasury, yeah. you know, within just a couple of days. Now, I don't think he's going to be doing that anytime soon, but just we should be ready for sometime, you know, next year, mm-hmm. 2024, in an election year um, of watching that communication and using the tool of, you know, the or his oratory skills yeah. to move monetary policy in the economy much more effectively yeah. 
than actually moving the Fed funds rate. Yeah, because their inflation, I think, is a political danger as much as it is a um, a like financial or economic danger. Yeah. Um, that and and I forget if I was talking here or beforehand, but but people sure do get mad about inflation um, mm, almost yeah. as much, maybe if maybe if, maybe more than an actual recession. Peep, the the consumer sentiment tracks because it, it affects everybody. I mean, if yeah. you're in a recession, you don't lose your job. You know, you, you think maybe things are slower. You don't. You know, if you're in sales, maybe mm-hmm. things are slower, but it doesn't affect you like. Inflation affects everybody, yeah. especially everybody, you know, below a certain percentage, you know, uh, of income. And mm. it feels like you can never get ahead because you probably have gotten a raise recently. You know, you've gotten a pay bump. Yeah. But you still don't have any more at the end of the month or after the paycheck. Mm-hmm. And so it feels like no matter how hard you work, you get a win. It's, you know, it's two steps forward and either, you know, one step back or maybe even one and a half steps yeah, back. They and always, it's frustrating. Yeah. And and prices always go up. They're never going to decrease. No. Um, very, very, very no. rarely do they decrease. And unless they're not. It, unless uh, you're Tesla. Yeah. And, and, and it is interesting to think of the fact that, uh, th- you know, if inflation does track with economic sentiment, so closely that it may be a greater danger and that may be why he is doing you know very on the side of hawkishness it may be greater danger to re if inflation rears its head than if then if a recession emerges in 2024 yeah so that's you know that's what he's dealing with and, and hopefully it makes his you know it, it makes it more comfortable for him to shut the yeah. door the other thing in, in the last piece and then we should move on to mm-hmm. this uli um report that we've covered once but it, it's such a good report i think it's worth thinking into you know, we, Matt, we talk a lot about, you know, commercial real estate and the wall of loan maturities are coming up. But it's not just it's not just multifamily. It's not just commercial real estate. It's also corporate debt. Yeah. It's floating floating rate corporate debt that's out there that has to be refinanced. Mm-hmm. And maybe most importantly than all is, you know, the U.S. federal government mm. debt that's hanging out there that needs to be refinanced. Yeah. I think last time I... I look, we're now paying over a trillion dollars a year in debt service. We, you know, in all of the short term treasuries that are issued, um, you know, the couple, you know, the two year, two year notes, five year notes, all whatever the maturity as those are coming due and they're having to go out and, you know, resell new treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. They're having to sell them at, you know, significantly higher rates. I mean, they were, they were selling, you know, 10 year bonds a couple of years ago for, um, you know, half a percent yield. You know, now they're four and a half percent yield. It's mm-hmm. a lot more expensive. It's multiple times more expensive to finance, yeah. you know, government spending. And it's not like we're spending less money like yeah. at, at, at all. And so this is a, it's a big problem. Um, just yeah. the amount of the debt. So it got has a, a Janet Yellen problem kind of is she, she's the head of uh, treasury. treasury. Yeah. Was she on the fed before? Yeah. Yeah. So she's on the other side now. Yeah, and yeah, that's a she is a problem. It's been a comfortable, lunch, an uncomfortable lunch meeting between. She, does us. she look like a you know she? She doesn't look like she's a friendly person. Like like she looks kind of like mean and haggardy, and I'm sure she's like a fine you know she's probably a mean grandma. She looks like Maybe. a mean like a like a mean like it's like you you know a grandmother almost always nice. She doesn't look like a nice grandma. <laughs> I don't think she's happy right now. <laughs> she's not happy uh, at all. And if I was if I was her, I wouldn't be happy either. You know, it's making this it's making my whole my job a, a whole lot harder. You know, if 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 the money doesn't go as far, if we're not bringing in as much money, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's a lot to deal with. But it is interesting that she's you know that she's she was on the other side of it. The biggest mistake that now this is more on the Trump administration than Biden administration. Um, although I think the Trump administration would push for this and suggested, but they they didn't do it. And Biden administration probably could have. There was enough time to do it. There was an opportunity. We could have issued hundred year bonds. Oh yeah, or fifty year bonds, a hundred year bonds. United States government, you know, back bonds mm-hmm. to sell to the world, you know, a note that's going to pay, you know, remember at the time interest rates in Germany and Europe were negative. Yeah. You know, people were, you know, institutions, countries, who, whoever was, were buying, you know, negative yielding bonds just because yeah. they thought they were going to lose less money that way because there was so little growth and so little inflation in the economy. Mm-hmm. We could have spread, you know, this debt out over the next hundred years and locked in low, we can, they can write whatever kind of bond they want. Yeah. We could have held onto those rates for 50 years, a hundred years at those low rates. Just didn't do it. Yeah. Just didn't, it was, you know, it, it's not, it's not, wouldn't be the first time a country has issued longer term maturity 
you know, debt. I'm not an ex- I'm not an expert on it, um, but we missed a big opportunity there. Um, and what the solution is? Well, without you know, you either need a lot, you know, higher tax revenue. Mm-hmm. That's probably going to come. No fun. Need to reduce spending. Mm-hmm. Not really going to happen unless we're going to talk about entitlements. Yeah, you know, we're going to write a. The, well, this know, is, we're so for war. this is really interesting too because it's like okay, interest rates are higher. Um, the government, which is a big part of the economy, is having to make it's having to spend less money because they don't have as much money. Yeah, well, extend well, that well, to we every should part. spend less. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a thing, good point. <laughs> but we're, 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 like, we're, we're, ideally, we're, they should. <laughs> ideally, we should. But yeah. you know, so much of it is, you know, just entitlement spending. You know, you can yeah. cut around the edges, and, and we're getting off topic, Matt. But other other than the fact that it's a problem that we talk about every week. It's affecting, can affect a much larger you know, areas of the economy. And then so, you know, on, coming back around to recession, soft landing, mm-hmm. like we've talked about the possibility of, you know, soft landing definitely being the case, but rates aren't getting down quick enough yeah. to solve this underlying problem that are going to, has they would have to come down soon, relatively soon to yeah. start to be in time. And it may be too late. It may be not. I hope, I hope that it's yeah. not yeah. too late. But we, this hasn't been dealt with yet. Mm-hmm. And so I think we don't know. Again, mm-hmm. let's start there. Recession, soft landing. But just because, you know, there was a nice, a softer CPI print in the stock mm-hmm. markets rallying in the 10 years down to four and a half, where, I mean, it was, I mean, four and a half was high a month ago. So now it seems low to everybody. Yeah. St- um, the, under the, dark clouds, you know, they're still circling. It really hasn't alleviated any of the problems yeah. unless we're getting down, you know, to, you know, a, closer to a, you know, I don't know, three and a half, and, 3%. And, you thing. know, as much as like a month or two ago, I, I, had, I was getting pretty, a lot more pessimistic about the economy. And, and now I'm a little bit more uncertain. And and what it really uh, what it really gets at is that we are getting into a kind of a new paradigm. That's the other possibility is like, what if higher for longer was real? You know, everyone wants it. Everyone wants them to snap their fingers and bring back low interest rates. Yeah. But if if uh, if every low if, if every like quasi, you know, uh, positive CPI print is going to lead to such a huge rally and like people champing at the bid and frothing frothing at the mouth to buy and sell, uh, then then there that's not an encouragement for them to lower rates really quickly no. because it could lead to to inflation that they're really scared about for good reason. And so if they're really scared about that for good reason, they probably will keep rates higher for longer. And the question is, what do the CRE markets do next and how do they adjust? Well, and even if they bring the Fed funds rate down to five, like mm-hmm. what does that really change? Like, okay, they, they bring it, they're not going to like drop it down yeah, to yeah. 2% or 3% mm-hmm. on the bat. So it's, they may begin... Now you could start making people will start making moves at that point. Well, and that's my yeah. that was my big question is what is in, in just the same way that I was saying like earlier, you know, everyone was calling for apocalypse or the threat of pandemic and there was a cost to not engaging in the market. Yeah. Um what is the cost to pretending that, you know, a 0.25% what's the cost to, to acting like the storm's over, you know? To 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 cheering prematurely. Yeah. And, and you know, you can be forward Yeah, you don't want to catch a falling knife but at the same yeah. time who doesn't want to try to, you know, buy at the bottom? Them, yeah, but again, catching the falling Everyone knife. is ready to buy at the bottom so much right now. Um, I, I was having a conversation um, with uh, another multifamily operator, um, August Biniaz, who mm-hmm. I know, uh, listener of the show. So August Neva, guys, hello, listening. how's it going? <laughs> um, but he asked me, you know, on our call, you know, okay, so you know, if the top of the market's twelve o'clock and bottom of the market's six o'clock, you know, where are we? Yeah, you know, in the cycle, and. You know, I'm like, well, we're not at six yet. I don't, we're yeah. not th- you know, we're not at three. Mm-hmm. So, you know, probably somewhere between kind of four and five, you know, yeah. maybe five, you know, maybe five, maybe five thirty, you know, yeah. without really knowing. And uh, yeah, I think we, we were on the same page and you can't know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and his, his point, his, his, uh, his advice was, you know, kind of buying between five and seven. Yeah. The clock is the best time. It's a good point. So, you know, you, you know, you can't, you have to acknowledge you can't time the bottom. Mm-hmm. But are we buying? Is it, you know, if it's three, if it's three p, if it's three o'clock, yeah, you know, you catch a falling knife. Yeah, if you're buying at five, you know, there's enough margin there on the upswing mm-hmm. that okay, you know, could you have gotten it cheaper? Yeah, yeah. but it, it's people, it's going to be and that's be fine. Yeah, yeah, and and what I'm saying is like people want to buy at the bottom, 
but it's still the math doesn't work. People start thinking about it at like eight. Yeah. If if you don't miss it, they're like, okay, let's start thinking about it at eight. And they don't really get in until about, you know, nine or 10. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to see this narrow cap rate interest rate spread and think that they're, uh, that like we're, we're pricing is, is at a comfortable place. Um, and looking ahead again, this is all stuff we've talked about the past couple, couple weeks. Um, looking at the head, uh, over the next couple of years, you know, that you're going to have to deal with that. And you can, there's such yeah. thing as too forward looking. Well, and that's what yeah. I think the damage is. I, I think what people are going to get um, entrenched in is that values are going to just keep going down and going down. Yeah. And when the reality is we'll have bottomed and if interest rates are starting to come down, that is going to lead to cap rates eventually coming down yeah. also. And so you're going to see values rise. And so then all of a sudden, you know, maybe you don't get the rent growth. And this is the hard part on underwriting right now is because you, know, you don't really want to factor in much growth because you know some markets aren't experiencing some growth. You just want to be you know safe, conserve in an environment where there's a lot of supply, which we're going to cover here in a minute. Mm-hmm. But also you, you you need to be conservative on exit caps. You know if you're bringing a deal to an investor, if you have an exit cap below six percent, they're going to look at you you know like you're taking too much risk. Yeah, and it should at least you know work in that environment. And so you know it's hard to be um, but. In reality, which again, it's not a good stress test, but if it rates come down, all we could easily be in an environment where dealers are selling at five caps all day long. Like yeah. that—that's not you know that's not um, beyond you know real ridiculous at, at all. Mm-hmm. And if that happens sooner rather than later, you know even if you bought it you know five o'clock, you've had it, you'll have a lot of appreciation in a relatively short amount of time yeah. with that cap rate compression. Um. Well, but, but, it, but again, the price, you know, the price still has to be right. And that's the challenge is there still is a gap. And sometimes when you underwrite it and even can sell it at a five cap, mm-hmm. if the returns still aren't that attractive, you know, that, that just means the deal is overpriced. Yeah. And I think that and what this uh, this Urban Land Institute um, report is getting at and I've kind of referenced this is, you know, we may be heading wherever interest rates in the in the commercial real estate market gets to um it it may not be back to where it was three years ago or eight years ago it may be it may be into an entirely new or new to some certain people but into like maybe interest rates are at three or four percent persistently and so we can't have the cap rates that were that were a factor or a product of low 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 like two one to two percent interest rates uh we'll have a we'll have something different and things are and that means you know relying on a different calculation and not expecting or putting that into your plan yeah Um, because i think that that was a lot of the people that are champing at the bit think that it's going to snap your fingers and it'll be like 2021 again. Yeah. Well, and people are chomping a bit because, I mean, they see really good fundamentals in yeah. the market. Um, yeah. I mean, outside of some plight coming on, there's a lot of demand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but Matt, you're talking about a great reset and just things are going to be different. Yeah. And that's what this report from the Urban Land Institute um, is all about. Um, we've mentioned this, what, two weeks ago, Matt, this report, we featured mm-hmm. parts of it. And Matt was like, this report is so, we, we said, well, this is, it's a, it's you a know what? report. I, um, I, I told you, I should have covered it. I, it was like a day late. And I was like, man, because we talked about every single thing that oh, they covered. We just, we just and it was like, it. it gave word to my so strongest feelings. So yeah. I feel like we did. Yeah. So we participated. And a lot of it is really talking about this concept of a reset where the market yep. is really being reset in a lot of ways that we've talked about. Um, Matt, where do you want to go first on this? Because again, it's a big report. Really just, I, I kind of, because it is 141 that. pages and we can't cover it all. I just want to cover the introduction because they're introductory. You know, a lot of times the introduction of some where of these this, reports. Where is this? This is nice. I don't know. It's like a nice little canal or something. Yeah. Oh, and this, this report is uh, also put out by PWC. Just... And, and so, nope. um, yeah, even just like kind of staying within the introduction, they have some really good um, summative, uh, some kind of summative moments um, that 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 lay out what a, what this great reset might might mean, and um, and it's really kind of calling us to think hard about a CRE market that does not have the low interest rates and cheap borrowing costs costs that have been so prevalent prevalent and helpful for the last fifteen years since the two thousand eight financial crisis. Um, and, you know, I've, I said this before, but I, I'll repeat it. Is it worth thinking about higher for longer? I think it is. You know, we can't just hang our hat on the latest CPI report and close the the uh, door on the uncomfortable possibility that inf- interest rates will not come down dramatically in the next year. And that um, everything's fine. 
Uh, yeah, well, and and and, and here's the thing: it, this it could be a soft landing, but a soft landing will still be a little bit uncomfortable. And the quote here is: <laughs> "Unbuckle your seatbelts because it's going to be a slow, careful ride. Um, disruption won't happen like a roller coaster. It's going to be slow going, and you're just going to have to do your homework when it comes to specific details and specific places and specific property types. That's we have been saying that for the whole year. Like 2023 is like you're going to have to work for your money now. <laughs> um, yeah, and and just like. Like really, like read this introduction because it is a mindset. It's a vibe. <laughs> I, I like mostly how they started, like the actual paragraph. Um, yeah. This this sentence right here. Um, and I, I thought. Oh yeah, yeah. Was, read it. Read it as dramatically is, as possible. This is what will be. That's it. This this is this is it. It is. Yeah. This is what will be. I'm um, a consensus is growing in the commercial real estate community that the world we're looking at is now the world we'll be living in for a while. The worst of COVID-19 pandemic is long past. We should no longer expect a sudden U-turn to the way things were in pre-pandemic times. Man, they had fun writing it. They had to. I mean, you, I mean, how often can, you know, economists, obviously recently, you, got, <laughs> you can throw pandemics in. Yeah, you know, this, yeah. this is reading like, um, you know, Blockbuster Hollywood. You know, this is like the next, uh, you know, Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. After three years of holding out hope, the industry leaders have finally concluded that the most of us really won't be returning to the office nearly as often, and some not at all. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. was I was just skimming. I was like, man, there's some good paragraphs. It's like, yeah, this is like the the, the Moby Dick of, uh, of yearly CRE reports. The great American commercial real estate uh, report is this. Um, but it, it does seem, you know, they have a chart here that talks about uh, reduced firm profitability prospects. Um, but but again, like they are the the emphasis that they have throughout this introduction as is that adjusting to this uh, to this changed paradigm is going to take time. And we've talked about how long it's going to take for people to come around to this new way of seeing the world, as it were. But it also means uh, and the, the quote from the, the ULI here is it means that owners will need to pay more attention to their operations and rein in extraneous expenses and people should not be relying on cap rate compression for the returns oh, um it's like we were talking about yeah exactly and like there's a lot more in here where this came from um but i don't feel like i'm misrepresenting this report by dwelling on this theme of a reset and the importance of a change strategy in this changed environment it, it could be Lower rent growth for the next year and a half, too. The report raises that possibility. And it's not to say, I don't think, that CRE markets are in a fraught position. It is, but it's like going from hot water to lukewarm water. You know, it feels cold. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like compared to that sky high growth we saw, it, it would easily seem like CRE is in this difficult fraught position. But it's not an impossible challenge if you adjust accordingly. And I think that there are plenty of sponsors, operators, investors that have been through multiple market cycles and what it was like, you know, in the early 2000s or, or even beforehand when markets weren't um, fueled so much by low interest rates. So it's not like it's not completely foreign, but it's going to take, I think, a whole lot of kicking and screaming to yeah. uh, to adjust to it. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a great point. You know, it's interesting, you know, how many groups, you know, were around before the great fin great financial crisis. I've been through a few cycles. There are mm -hmm. definitely quite a lot, quite a few folks. It, it's interesting how people move around kind of industry to industry or asset yeah. class or, you know, working at a, as a lender at the time. Now mm. they turn into an owner. And um, so there's a lot of different perspectives, which which is yeah. interesting. And some of the groups, a lot of groups went out of business. Um, other groups, um, you know, are have grown into, you know, very massive companies because some – they really got a lot of their growth after the great financial crisis mm -hmm. who, you know, they're in, um, you know, sometimes different situations as others, um, sometimes worse scenarios because um, you can, you know, do bad things at scale. But also sometimes at scale, you can have resources to kind of avoid some of the traps that a less capitalized firms um, can find themselves yeah. in. So. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. It's getting the interesting um, those perspectives, Matt. Yeah. So um, that's that's really all that I wanted to to know. And I know it was a short it, it was a short note here. Um, they do have in, information. That it's it's pretty actually a little bit obvious about the top concerns of the uh, uh, for for real estate in 2024. It's it's interest rates, cost of capital, and high housing costs and high construction labor costs. Really not a surprise. It's expensive. Interest rates are a drag, and even construction labor still remains a challenge but uh there you know people aren't uh 
people aren't blind to what the real challenges are. I think that what they may be blind is, is like adjusting to these challenges is going to have a cost. And the cost could be, you know, the uh, valuation of their assets, it will be impacted. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, housing costs and availability are still, um, you know, the number one of greatest importance um, for social and political issues. Yeah. And, and I think that's gr- driving, um, you know, their um, topic up at the top of the report of, you know, itching to buy. There's a lot of multifamily mm-hmm. um, investors who are trying to get into space, still really, you know, believe in the fundamentals, you yeah. know, a- as do we. It's just a question of, you know, at what price, you know, do you want to continue, you know, do you want to acquire mm-hmm. it? And what returns do you want to hit? Because a lot of the long term fundamentals are still checking um, a lot of boxes, even yeah. with some of the short term. Um, supply and growth headwinds, which are obviously related, that we can talk about. Um, yeah, let's, talk, do. Let's, let's talk about let's talk about that right now, and then we can finish up with the CBR totally. CBR report. Perfect. Um, but I, I recommend everyone who is want to take a deep dive, um, yeah. you know, hop into that ULI report, and, and that's why you want to be subscribed to the newsletter, right? The Great mm-hmm. Report newsletter. You can sign up greatcapitalllc.com slash newsletter. It's right on our website. Um, that you're going to get these articles sent to you twice a week. Um, with great analysis, Man, it, it's it's it is uh it's the best it's the best newsletter in the industry. We'll get I get the good headlines. If the headline is not good enough, that if it's like Apply. November report, no no no, I want to say what they you know uh, something more catchy, a little bit of what's inside there. So you read the headline, you're gonna actually know what's in there. Okay, see we got we got good <laughs> we got good subject writer, good headlines. Um, or, or if not, let, let, let us, yeah, let us know. That's right. A good point. Very good point. Yeah. Okay, Matt, what's going on in the supply? Um, I've heard there's a ton of units yes. coming online. I've heard numbers like 1.1 million in the pipeline, la da What does it mean? What do we see coming down the pike? This is a real prediction of the future oh. um, here. So um, they have, you know, number year by year. Um, in 2023, they are expecting uh, by the end of the year, 487,512 new uh, apartments entering in the market. 2024 even more so as much as 2023 was dominated by the idea of new supply we're going to get in next year 536,145 apartments that and uh that is a, so we're just really getting we're getting started yeah yeah mm-hmm. um it, it is a crazy increase and following that even in 2025 you have 451,430 uh, new units coming online. And then it's only really in 2026 where there is a reduction and it goes back down to 377,622. Wow. And and then, it, and on from there, 27 and 28, around 400,000. 400,000 is a healthy high number. I, I think yeah, it's, that, it's still high. Matt, let me, let me yeah. ask you, um, let me ask you something real quick. How are they projecting, you know, outside of 2026, you know, they're like, they're projecting, you know, 400,000. Are these actual, you know, kind of, you know, plans, permits, or are they extrapolating out what they, what they believe is going to be delivered? Because, think- you know, most projects, you know, usually, you know, 36 months or so. So I can see having good insight into 2025 through 2026, 27, 28, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, there's a little bit of what, mysticism, I think, in what, there. Like, yeah, well, what, what do you think? And, and I think that they do actually, lower lower in the report, they have a worst case and best case scenario. So um, I'm sure they're relying on, you know, f- permit starts and, and the information that's publicly available uh, about all this kind of construction activity and then extrapolating on that. Like, because a lot of times permits will get dropped. Well, that, that, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm asking yeah. is because um, I know there's a lot of people who are interested in building, but the financing isn't there. Mm-hmm. You know, just the, the deals aren't penciling right now. It just like well, we talked about, just the interest rates are making it really difficult, yeah. and the leverage, the credit, just doesn't exist like it used to. And so we're seeing a lot of pencils, you know, kind of being, you know, mo- or a lot of projects being, um, you know, mothballed mm-hmm. and you know, or just passed on. And even some, you know, companies I see are you know laying off, you know, part- portion of the development team just because mm. they, you know, the projects just they don't have any projects to work on right now. And so I'm curious, you know, in this number. Really, I think the most of the deals that are going to be delivered 2024 and 2025, these are, I, be, I would believe mm-hmm. that these were pretty well baked. Yeah. But outside of this, um, I could see it come in, you know, I, I would imagine that it, we might see these revised down. Yeah, especially because like the typical time, and, and I don't know what the time is from like permitting to, to end, but like usually it's about 24 months. 
um, to to get something built. So 2028, this could just be you know the the gleam in someone's eye <laughs> or something. Like it's maybe yeah. not even started yet. Um, but uh, they but I, I do like that they have you know they factor in what what will happen if in a more maybe downbeat economy and even in a downbeat economy there's still a healthy amount of new supply. I wonder if the 26 27 28 numbers would be a, will be a little lower than they expect but this that's all going to really maybe depend on uh, you know how how much how much gets built and how much gets financed um, and if things are higher yeah. for longer well you know then here in this statistic you know they they are showing that um, you know the starts are dropping off um having units started structures with five or more units um, you know, that, 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 that monthly, yeah, that is really starting sharp. to come down, Yeah, but still as it is stands, I mean, we're at, you know, peak, you know, this is you know, just going back a couple of years, mm-hmm. but certainly we're building more units than we have ever built in the near term. And then I think what's important is, you know, we're just talking about right now, just national numbers, which can tell you something, but n- not that useful if you're an actual investor looking into in- investing in a deal because there's some markets with no new supply. Yeah, coming yeah, on. and that's another. That's so. That's super important. Is is supply is a local thing, and and um, that's one thing. You know, I think that rents and supply national numbers. That's great as a yardstick, as a general vibe. Yeah. But if you really want to know what's happening, yeah, you got to got to look at the market that you're involved in. And we've seen a lot of correlations. I know RealPage has done a lot of work on this as well, you know, seeing a big correlation between um, markets that have high percentage, you know, of inventories you mm-hmm. know, relative to or here, you're either calling it percentage of stock um, and low percentage of stock markets with the high percentage of stock markets really seeing slow negative growth and yeah. markets that have a lot of supply, low percentage of stock are seeing really decent um, rank growth, you know, this is top 15 market um, for forecasting supply number of units. I don't really know what that means, Matt. Um, well, look at top, this. Top units is top market is large. So, so the number and then b- below is like the top, top percentage supply. of top supply. Yeah. Yep. And look at how Feast, much. Yeah, 20,000 units coming online in 23, another 17,000 yeah. um, coming online in 2024. Look at Austin. They're adding 7.5% to their stock this year, which is a lot. And then next year, 9.2% added. And if you look at the On two years of, combined, yeah, yeah wow. that, that's incredible, you know. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Eight, almost almost 18%. It, wow, that is, yeah, that's v- legit incredible. Um, and and that is, that is it's not an unusual story. Now that's a big increase on in, upon an increase, but it's not like it's alone. Charlotte is two seven seven percent increases in their, in their stock yeah. in in two consecutive years. So this is a, uh, like I said, 2024 is not going to be a rest or relief, um, mm-hmm. especially for some of these markets. Yeah. And then with- Huntsville, these are, just, these are the top markets as a you know, percent of stock. Huntsville, um, 2024, well, 2023, we knew this. Uh, I remember talking about this last year, man. Yeah. Delivering, you know, almost 13% of stock. Then next year, another 6%. Um, Southwest Florida, Coast nine point four percent this year, seven and a half next year. I mean, Colorado Springs, Matt. I mean, eight point four percent in twenty three, ten point three percent in twenty twenty four is expected to be delivered. These are a lot of units. Again, Austin on a number of units, but also a percentage basis. That's that that we've already talked about the percentages. That that's a lot. Look a lot at this, units. Madison, Wisconsin looks like the only one in this list. That is in the Midwest. Yeah. Now I'll have to look at the numbers for, and if you scroll up to the numbers for, you know, on purely numerical basis, I don't think that there is any a Midwestern market in there. Um, not not no. if Nash. I don't think Nashville counts. That's no, no, yep. only if we wanted it to. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so so they're still you know they're still not building as much in the Midwest as uh, as they are in you know the Sun Belt and the kind of Mountain West areas. But totals um this is this is something key to watch because again you know if you are looking at a deal one of the big assumptions that is much less certain today than it was in previous years and previous cycles is what is that rent growth assumption what is the organic yeah. rent growth that you may or may not get in the first couple of years mm-hmm. that growth rate is you know compounding you know and the getting a good return on real estate is to be able to deliver a decent amount of growth in year one you know on yeah. a stabilized acquisition so you can compound off that growth mm-hmm. so if you you know if you're if zero if you're growing by nothing in the first year you know that's not a great number to compound off of yeah um yeah. 
you're a whole year behind, you know, time is valuable, time is money. And if we're looking at an, an IRR, internal rate of return calculation, again, you're basically adding a whole other year on the period, but, you know, but, but no growth in one of the periods. Yeah. So there's no way that you can achieve, you know, decent looking returns. And if you're going to see, um, you know, very slow growth for several years, again, then that's just further challenge to modeling and doing a reasonable portfolio mm -hmm. if there's going to be, you know, half a million units delivered, you know, every single year, which I'm skeptical past, yeah. you know, past yeah. couple of years. But if that's the case, and so that's why we just need to really keep watching. Yeah. And if valuations are a product, which they are uh, largely uh, a product of the income generated by, by a piece of CRE or like a property, a CRE property, then, uh, then it's hard to think that we have completely reached bottom if we're looking forward to a year. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And I, I also think that it underlines the, you know, the current strength of the Midwest and mm -hmm. some other select markets around yeah. the country um, in some kind of short term, I say it short term weakness in the Sun Belt, just with all the supply that's going to be coming online. Yeah. There's a lot of these, you know, big growth markets looking at, you know, at least another year or two of slow, no growth, mm -hmm. which, you know, we know all the acquisitions in those markets you know, the whole basis case thesis was to high growth. So yeah. everyone was, you know, you know, plugging in high growth numbers. The only caveat that I would have to yeah. this picture of perhaps like rent stagnation in 2024 is I think that a lot of the lower rent growth in 2023 was like we're in the wake of the super high rent growth that, mm -hmm. we, that we had the previous. So it's kind of a, a reaction from people's pocketbooks. Yeah. Uh, um, and so I think yeah. that that's a little bit in the past and that may help rent growth a little bit in 2024 yeah. as, as people are like, all right, you know, I can deal with this. That's my hope. So, <laughs> so we can only we can only hope. All right, yeah. Matt. Um, so look, moving on to the CBR CBRE report. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was, it's actually it was a call. It's not a, it's not a report. So I, I apologize. What did they call a client it a call. Client, it was a client call, but a, a client call for everybody. How much stress is likely on the road to distress? Matt, CBR, if correct me if I'm wrong, they just came out with a report a month or so ago, calling the bottom or the top of cap rates, yeah. bottom of the market, yeah. um, saying you know, we most likely to see cap rate compression going forward, or at least maybe stabilization is maybe mm -hmm. more of what they were saying. Has anything changed since that report? It was now they're talking about a stressful road to distress. So that doesn't sound like cap rates are. Um, yeah, this video you know, caught me depressing. by surprise a little bit um, because, like, like kind you said, play. they yeah. Well, if you yeah, if you want to, um, is it something that we watch? Um, you know what? I, I think the it's, it's something that we could probably watch in the background. Um, I I just want to uh, I just want to kind of Hello. say even in the and first. Should, should I mute it then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it doesn't even want me to do. <laughs> well, even in the first two minutes Hello. of this. Um, so it's not you know if you no, want to. Are there any like visuals? Or are we just gonna have uh, this? Just talking heads. If you want the. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Where, when's that? Where's that? Oh yeah, Chris. Okay. Continued. So, um, yeah, again, in the first two minutes, there's this like four, maybe maybe more like five, but there's like this forthright analysis of the state of CRE that does not exactly line up with the dominant messaging mm -hmm. that I've gotten from CBRE, where they're saying, yes, prices are hitting bottom. People are uh, people are jumping into the market and they're ready to invest, uh, you know, like, come on, uh, come on, everybody. Come one, come all. Um, things are going to be things are doing great. They're talking about challenges that are being worked through, and there, you know, there's a quote in here that's like, "We see things building. We are the start of this, um, the start of this phase." Which I kind of identified as like, "These are the debt. This is the debt troubles phase." I don't think, you know, m maybe, uh, maybe there will never be like a, uh, a sell for cheaper phase, but we're definitely so in a debt trouble we, phase. We've moved, so we we have moved. I do believe, man, what you're saying. We moved past denial, and we're into fear. Yeah, 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 yeah. I still think that there's room for bargaining somewhere, and maybe that's where maybe that's where the deals come through. Well, that's is, the fear. The fear, sorry, you start yeah. like yeah, bargaining at that point. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay, it's like a, the, the denial phase is there's no problem. Cap rates are already going yeah. Yeah, back down, and we're all good. There's no problem here. Yeah, we're and, fine. And the quote here is: "We are at the moment where that will quote." help pave the way for an expansionary cycle. I really want to emphasize this because if it's going to because pave the, the way. the only way we can sell real estate. Yeah, yeah. Because if it paves the way, that means we're not in it yet. Yeah. Um, and, and in the debt world, delinquencies are growing. And um, Kelly Carhart, who you see now here, she's the executive managing director yeah. of Multifamily Capital Markets, says that delinquencies are growing. And she says, we see it building. There are, you know, this, this issue of debt and the troubles that banks 
and borrowers are having is, uh, you know, is growing. And again, I kind of want to paint this picture for you. Just imagine scrolling through thousands of LinkedIn posts that say the cap rate interest rate is like totally fine. And now, you know, the uh, picture the previous, you know, previous weeks of all this soothing CBRE words, mm. uh, you know, that, oh yeah, we- we'll Do they get- have like a, like a, like a meditation like tape <laughs> that they put out? Well, uh, you know, that uh, maybe they do, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, it definitely helps you feel good but um but then you know contrast that with with this with these uh, with these comments here that's talking about how trouble with multifamily lending is building and not receding, I think a surprising revelation from a CBRE team that recently increased its interest rate projections, but did its best to make its audience think that rates were coming down. Like they're really, really trying to frame and, and I get at me in the comments if, you know, if, if I've read this wrong, but it certainly did seem like they were making a rhetorical point to downplay the future challenges in the debt market in 2024. Um, well, not they in have, this They video. have to be able to, they can't have complete cognitive dissonance with their clients in just the reality. They, yeah, they, they yeah. can't say, they can't say, you know, the sky is, is green if it's, if, it, if it's yeah, not green yeah. and be taken seriously and, and continue to do business. Mm-hmm. So they have to acknowledge the realities of the world, but at the same time, their conclusion always has to be now is a time to buy real estate. Yeah. Yeah. And now is the time to get in and because the alternative is they don't have a business. And I don't want to neglect to say that at the very, very, very beginning of this video, uh, there was some dramatic language where the guy was like, you know, in times like these, you, some people will look to survive and other people's will look to thrive. Yeah. And it's like, you yeah. know, this is the time where the men are made or whatever. Um, but yeah. uh, but uh, it's not wrong. Not wrong. Not um, wrong. And, but, you know, also, yeah. you know, men get, you know, slaughtered at the same time. <laughs> That's say, true. Yeah. Uh, depending on their strategy and tactics. Yeah. You know, I'm all about I'm all I'm all for that. I think mm-hmm. right now is the time to, you know, be nimble and look for opportunities yes. because, you know, if we are at four thirty, five o'clock, there are gonna be opportunities that are gonna be, you know, coming up. But at, mm-hmm. you know, I guess I, I just take issue with the kind of the the, the blind um I don't want to say the blind leading the blind, but just mm-hmm. kind of the um okay, yeah, screw it. Let's just do it regardless of the math because like yeah because yeah. i don't know how many times i'm like let's just do it. i will let's just let, let's just do it let's look at it and but mm-hmm. you know the 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 math gets in the way yeah yeah and that's and and that's an easy you know an easy like thing math. that <laughs> like i'd be the first one to be like guys are we really we're trusting math now yeah 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 uh but even even the story you know the, the story that they're telling here apart from like the, sh- the raw numbers is you know we're in just as as jack howard is is explaining probably right now this is the guy that's on the screen he's the executive vice president of loan and portfolio sales and he's saying that with regards to secondary market loan sales it feels like we're still in the early innings um secondary market loan sales were in the 10 to 25 billion range in 2024 compared to the 15 to 25 billion volume in the 2010 to 2026 era so under regulatory pressure and this is kind of what he's explaining right now um under these under this regulatory pressure banks are reducing cre exposure specific specifically to at-risk property types mainly office and to a much lesser extent multifamily um which kind of continues to be the mission and um what what he also explains is that family offices much more than in in institutions family offices and private investors are buying up a lot of these assets on a price basis and kind of singling out office properties here Mm. because institutions aren't really jumping in yeah. at that moment. Um, and, and Kelly is jumping back in here and to explain how they expect a lot more activity in 2024. But I'll stop the play-by-play ju- here just okay. to say that instead of operating with the assumption that our prices are going up and up and up, it seems like the unstated reason why there would be more buying in 2024 is that maybe prices would be going down. Um, he, he, you know, Well, and, that, and that's the, again, that's the hard thing for them is that it, it shouldn't it matters less of like what the price is. Mm-hmm. It's just that there needs to be deals to do in volume. Yeah. And and so on one hand, they need to say, now's a good time to buy, but mm-hmm. also, you know, the prices are going down. It's gonna be even a better time to buy, you know, soon. Yeah. And all of this is true at the same time. Mm-hmm. And nobody they don't know, no we don't know, no nobody really knows. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're all gonna be driven by our self interest. Yeah, because what would and and like like we've just explained, it's going to be a long. It it will take a long time for interest rates to come down. Twenty twenty four has and twenty twenty five 
you know, half of it, it's going to, it we'll have some like rent growth issues because of the new supply. So what would bring prices down or what would bring buying activity up if not prices going down? Yeah, that would um, be it. That would be it. Either yeah. prices need to come down or interest rates need to come down yeah. or both. Yeah. And, and again, scrolling past the thousands of LinkedIn posts, you'll see explanations Well, well, actually, no, I can buy at a really, uh, you know, at a really low cap rate because I've got this growth plan, but you know, we've just saw all those markets with all that new supply coming. Um, that can't be even, yeah. you know, that can't be even a, a, a plurality, much less a majority of, um, you know, of examples that are, yeah. that are in the market. It definitely does not characterize it. So um, if everyone has that same idea, then that's not, gonna, it's not going to happen. It's not going to yeah. work. Uh, I think that just like uh, urban, you know, the Urban Land Institute has said, this is the beginning of maybe a, a reset. And what I think is really interesting is that private investors and are getting into this debt market, and uh, and capital still flowing, and and people are still figuring things out. And uh, maybe regulators will will find a way to uh, to well, regulate that out of existence. I was going to say but, we uh, talked about that last week, is where the non-bank lenders yeah. are really kind of stepping in. In a lot mm -hmm. of cases to, you know, provide the necessary, you know, liquidity, kind of the, the market's finding a way, yeah. you know, unless Janet Yellen has anything to say about it. Well, and and I'm sure that there's like reasons, like obviously these regulations were put, were, were put upon banks to make sure that like things don't go haywire. And like, uh, I, I'd like to think it wasn't, they're not just there for fun. There's always good intentions. Sure. Are, you, know. you know, you gotta, you gotta um, try to show people you're doing something. Yeah, exactly. You gotta earn your money. Yeah, you, the <laughs> fat cats on Wall Street. Yeah, I, uh, but um, but I I wonder if you know I wonder what the big concern is over these these private investors uh, that are taking on you know the debt in this way. Like, what is what do you think the big danger is of a less regulated uh, mass of you know of debt that's going to be held by people that aren't banks anymore you know obviously you know there's always the concern that you know some sort of you know nefarious activities going on or some sort of fraud or non-disclosure mm -hmm. you know what investors believe they're investing in you know that's always you know a, a possibility in an environment where there's you know less you know regulation yeah that's why it's important into investors to do you know, do your due diligence on you know anything that you're investing in and then, you know, sponsors that are using maybe some of these non-bank lenders, make sure, you know, exactly who you're getting in bed with is going to be a good partner. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to just be, um, you know, predatory, you know, yeah. towards your deal. Um, but I, I think a lot of these non-bank lenders are, are filling a, a sweet spot. But, you know, the, the, the one thing, there is danger out there. And, you know, Matt, we're, 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 we, we have a preferred equity product that we're talking to a lot of sponsors about. Mm-hmm. I looked at a, a lot. I've looked at a handful of really good deals. Really good sponsors, good operators. Mm -hmm. Also looked at some really bad deals. Yeah, yeah. And and sometimes from some people that seem like they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and a lot of these are coming through you know lenders. And you know, there's some you know groups that you see on social media a lot that you know you people you people comment like these guys are great. These guys are great. You know, you see them all over the place. Um, and it's a handful of different groups, but there's groups that are, you know, getting in trouble right now. Yeah. And the way that some of these deals are being structured, the assumptions that people are making are really risky. And you re now is a time more than ever to be careful. And I think it's always a time to be careful and prudent. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a long period of time where the deals worked out because the market was very favorable. Mm -hmm. And we're, we'll be back in a spot. I mean, because this, the real estate cycle is nice and long. Yeah. So if you're if you catch the ups, it, it, it's it's a game of musical chairs. The music goes on for a while. It's yeah. just when it stops, it there aren't that many chairs left. And if you've been taking as you know certain amount of risk, you could be caught without a seat. Yeah. You know. Well, before. and that's what I was thinking too. Is like a lot of the risk for when I think, and maybe it's because like this is what we're getting involved in is a lot of the risk of of private lending is on the lender side. Um, is, you know, if they're taking up and they're not, and they're not used to this position as a lender the, in the same way that the bank 
that the bank is and banks have all these systems for making sure that you know the asset is on the up and up and and your yeah, projections are right yeah sort of yeah, well sort of <laughs> some of them well maybe you're learning the, yeah yeah maybe we're learning that we're differently but but well because ba- banks were running after deals too yeah yeah that they were throwing around money and debt i mean the, the unlimited money was but, not i mean they had more access to money than yeah than but these else but but to get into like a private lending to get into private lending in this way, then you would have to make sure that the people that invest with you, you know, that you're not that you're going to do right with with you by your investors as well. So there's yeah, a well, risk yeah, on the prep equity, it, it's a challenge, but especially in some some of the smaller deals, and, and we're carving out a niche doing smaller doing smaller check sizes, like small as like a half a million bucks. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't make sense to, to do check sizes that small, but we are because there, there's no really there's just nobody doing it, yeah. um, and sometimes that just any, any anyway, but you know. The reason why that's challenging is because we have to do due diligence almost like we're buying the, the asset itself. Yeah. Um, you know, site visits, you know, mm-hmm. uh, reports, studies, um, underwriting, you know, walks, the the whole the whole thing, um, you know, titles or all, all environmental, all that stuff. Yeah, because you're now, we're not b- too big to fail yet. Yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, we yeah, we're not exactly. And um now fortunately, you know, the lender's doing a lot of that, so you can piggyback. Mm-hmm. But um it's a decent amount of work and due diligence, and you, I think a lot of people are just going to be signing stuff up, yeah, just looking at the coupon. Um, but you got to know what you're getting yourself into, yeah. And um, again, man, just a lot of a lot of mediocre deals have been done in the past couple of years. Um, I don't put ourselves um, in the in that group. Um, what what I think is a lot of real, mediocre deals. Yeah, we're done. What I think is interesting about the way that some of this debt is set up is you, it is a little a little bit less risky the way it is in the cap the way that it operates in the capital stack so maybe you know you could take a little bit less risky deals and you could say well all right it's risky enough that, that we'll get paid their their investors may not get their you know their LPs may not get paid but but like this is this meets our threshold for us getting paid well uh, it, that's it a is, cynical it, talking about, yeah talking to, yeah Deploying preferred equity it, it is a different calculation, and it's been a um, a little bit of mindset shift for me personally and mm-hmm. us. You know, looking at it from about you know the lenders gonna look at a deal a little bit different than yeah we would versus you know just you know common equity an LP a sponsor everyone's gonna look at it different because your incentives are a little bit different. You get paid mm-hmm. different times for different things, and um, you know like a a lender you know it's like, okay we have to check these boxes. You know, it, it needs to be able to cover reasonable assumptions. Needs to be, be able to pay us. Mm-hmm. But a lot of lenders aren't as concerned about you know everything else with the deal. You know, they're yeah. not. I mean, yeah, they want to make sure that's in decent condition. They want to make sure you have enough reserves. But you know, they're not going to get into like you know the aesthetics or like you know they're not going to get in. You know, they're not going to really push you hard on all of your assumptions. If anything, they may be, you know, tell you to be more aggressive in some ways. Yeah. Um, but. Whereas, like, if you're an LP, you may really be interested in what the Reno plan is, mm-hmm. like, w- w- what, yeah. what kind of countertops, you know, what's the what's the budget. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, not that the lender isn't, but they're more just looking at it from like, do the numbers make sense? Yeah. Whereas an LP is looking at, you know, is there a chance for real, uh, really upside here? Because a bank, mm-hmm. again, and preferred equity is like, we just need to get our coupon, and the rest of it is fine. That, that that's for you. Yeah. Um, but so, so it's just a different. Um, looking at things through a different perspective, but also knowing that you, you can't let your guard down just because you, you only mm-hmm. need to get an X return you know, or a smaller you know check relative to the whole yeah. capital stack doesn't mean you can just just start assuming things. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's a it's a different it's a different perspective. Um. A lot of great a lot of great operators out there. We're having a lot of really good conversations. A lot of really good conversations with banks. Um. But also operators and some sponsors. There's some good deals out there. Yeah. Good, there's good deals. And this is what we're really looking for. Good mm-hmm. deals, good real estate that is just financially, just the interest rates are making it really yeah. difficult. Yeah. Whether it's a rate cap that's coming due and looking at the refinancing or buying a new rate cap, or you know, there's a loan maturity coming due and there's just a gap in equity and using preferred equity is less dilutive than doing a full-on capital call to yeah. their LPs. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's on every deal. But the few that are out there, which we're finding, I think it's a really good fit. And yeah. um, 
you know, for us, it allows us to see a lot more, you know, opportunities. It's a way for us to really add value to our investors who are looking to continue to invest in real estate. Yeah. But they don't want to take as much risk right now. But they want mm-hmm. a decent return. This is exactly kind of what that does. Yeah. Um, so that that's really exciting. It's not it's not as profitable from like the our, our side, the GP sponsor. So all other GPs out there, you know, you can do it, but it, it's you're not going to make as much money just than buying deals. Yeah. But again, for us. We're providing value to our LPs. We have the deal flow. We have the, we have the ability to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if we can improve, get closer to our banking and lending relationships and yep. you know, talk to a lot of great sponsors in the meantime, see a lot of deals. Yeah, it's, uh, it's super it's well interesting. Uh, how, you know, and, and this is just back to the talking heads that have been, oh, we're sitting, <laughs> that so, have been talking for the, in the background. Going. For all right. Like, all right. But, uh, but you know, to, to return to the comments that were made by CBRE, it, it's super interesting to me that institutional capital is is holding out at this moment and the and the more nimble uh, I might I might argue uh, the more nimble private investors and family offices are jumping in because maybe they're closer to and they can see this opportunity yeah you know, I think that's a good point because I think it's interesting initial conversations versus like real conversations and yep. initially you know we were looking at you know, different angles different ways to you know approach the market as it is and what we were told by a lot of people again, just initial conversations. There's a, they're like, oh, there's a ton of people doing that. There's a ton of rescue funds. There's mm-hmm. tons yeah, of yeah. you know distress funds. There's a lot of tons of pref. Everyone's doing pref equity, mm-hmm. and there there are people that are trying. There are are people who are have talked about it and are trying to do it. There's not a lot of it actually being done, mm. and a lot of it also isn't isn't actually even real. Yeah. Like 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 huh. yeah, well we've talked about a program, but it it really doesn't work. Yeah, um, uh, a couple big you know big lenders. And even some of the agencies have talked about it. Then when I, I go a couple of layers deeper, when I ask people who know, I'm being told, no, that's not like, that's not really happening. Hmm. Like, or like, hey, it's not really, it's not, a, yeah. it's not really all the way there. I remember hearing about this in like late 2022 about people was like, well, yeah, obviously next is people, everyone's going to be jumping into the, this pref equity yeah. stuff. Well, and I did, I did talk to a couple of groups that like had started doing it mm-hmm. at the beginning of this year and they couldn't find any deals. Huh. You know, just everyone thought a recession was going to come. Yeah, you know, yeah. Earlier this year, so I don't, I, I don't know. You know, maybe we're not hitting the timing right either. Um, but um, you know, so far we're seeing a lot of really interesting opportunities. Where yeah. I think it's a good fit. And again, I think for credit investors who are looking for kind of twelve to fifteen percent returns, but you mm-hmm. sit right behind the bank. Um, you know, without the kind of the risk of, you know, what if things don't work out? Yeah. Um, it's really, I, th- I think, kind of the sweet spot in terms of, you know, risk adjusted returns right now. Yeah. And so that's what yeah. all the smart money is lo- looking for. The mm-hmm. challenge is they can't find it. They can't find the deals. And so that's what we're doing. We're finding the deals, working directly with the banks, lenders, um, and sponsors, but mostly with, with some of our banking partners and lending partners who are coming to us saying like, all right, you guys kind of know enough of what you're doing, mm-hmm. been around good operator we've got you guys have we've done a lot of business with you we want you to work with our borrower here's the deal yeah let's figure out a solution and you know we're relatively flexible relatively easy to work with and so and so far it's worked out really well yeah yeah that's interesting it's a and you know i could be wrong that, that this is the debt era but it does seem like we are that uh that a lot of that's where the activity is and uh and i'm i'm interested you know you said you see you see good you're seeing good deals and bad deals and uh you know some of these deals are going to be working out on the sales market um they're yeah. in that market yeah. now they're trying to figure yeah. it out true. but true. but true. Um, eventually you know they'll realize okay we can't get this solution here and uh you know the next step is is put it up for sale yeah and then see if, if there's a bid yeah all right um make sure that you subscribe to the great capital youtube channel leaving us a you know comment um a like especially even if you didn't like it if yeah. Oh, tell, yeah. For tell, sure. Tell us. This is what we'd like you to do. Tell us you didn't like in the comments, <laughs> but then give us the like button. Yeah, that, yeah, that way, that's that way, right. we don't see like a percentage of only like eighty five percent of people liked yeah. it. Yeah. Either way, um, if you are a multifamily sponsor and you're interested in talking to us about our preferred equity program, um, get in touch with um, either Blake or Griffin. Um, Blake at GreatCapitalLLC.com or Griffin at GreatCapitalLLC.com. If you're a credit investor, you can get in touch with those guys too or um, send us a message on LinkedIn. Go to our website, Great Capital. Actually, that's a similar website. If you're an yeah. investor, GreatCapitalLLC.com. Um, that way you can just create an account in our investor portal, learn all about it, what we're doing, schedule a meeting. Um, that's usually the best way to go. You can email us too. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're not too hard to get a hold of. 
um, you can call us, but don't just, just email us. Just, you know, we'll in the middle of a podcast or something. Um, now this was fun. Any, anything else? We've got a networking event coming up in December. Yeah. If you're in, in Indianapolis, CRE networking event, multifamily, yeah. CRE. We've got folks. more, you know, I'm sure that we'll have more to share about our progress here with, uh, with, you know, our pref equity and everything else. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, this is just the start. This is just the start of it. And then, uh, any of new this. episodes of The Complex, Katrina Green, oh, yeah, Director of Property Management? Uh, I think there's coming up one, one coming up this week. So. Okay, so, you know, if, again, if you know, this is the year of the operators, they all, as oh, they all yeah. say. Um, we've got one of the best, you know, operating pros, you know, in the business. Um, Grow Residential Zone, Katrina Green, Director of Property Management. She has a podcast called The Complex that is unlike really anything that's el- else that's out there. Yeah. Some of the other, like, like there's like th- two or three others man, on property management. They are, they are, they're so, they're so, um, you can say boring if you want. Yeah. And they're <laughs> sterile and dry, but Katrina keeps it fun. Oh yeah. And it's like really interesting stuff and bringing in experts from just all across the industry. I mean, like lead leading experts. So if you are an operator, if you're a multifamily investor and that you don't need to know anything about multifamily operations, you are wrong. And you need to listen to the podcast. You Even to to if you're complex. not interested in apartments, you could listen to an episode of the comments. Like, oh yeah, that's just kind of that's really interesting. Which is well, it's just a fun show yeah, too. Yeah. So check it out. Um, we'll catch you next week. Oh, also you know newsletter greatcapitalllc.com slash newsletter. And um, I don't want to promote anything else, Matt. All right, it's good. All right, catch you next time.